The following interview was conducted with <coughs> Joseph Paul Minton, um, class of 1945 in the Aero School for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, October 14, 2010 at Stewart Center. Also sitting in is his wife Nancy, also a Purdue grad, and his daughter Joan Minton Christopher, also a Purdue grad. Welcome. And good Thank morning you. to you. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. All right. <clears throat> born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, went to school there. Lived in one house the entire time for that period. I left in early 43. I had started flying in high school. How did that come about? Well, I was totally involved in aviation and flying and heroes like Roscoe Turner and Jimmy Doolittle and Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart, et cetera. So I really got the bug to fly and I would work two or three jobs while in high school to make enough money to go out and spend it flying. Was so, there an air, air uh, field close to where well, you lived? Well, in? Houston Municipal was a fairly large field and it wasn't too far away. Okay. So, but I, I spent my activities doing that, uh, no sports. And there were some Tell us a little about high school too. Uh, I didn't do too well in high school. I, they were happy to see me leave, but I spent most of my time flying or working jobs in order to fly. What so, kind of planes were you flying? Oh, Prop planes probably, right? Propeller, absolutely. Would you call it a biplane with struts and wires and open cockpit and no brakes and no radio? Other than that, it was fine. It worked great. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, but we were flying out of there, I was, and uh, they had a few DC-3s, Eastern Airlines, and Braniff in and out of there. I mean, it was a pretty big airport. Sure, start. okay. And uh, so we busily, I did, dodged those and continued to fly. Where then, um, when you, how large was your high school? Pretty good size? I think thousands. <laughs> there were only seven high schools in Houston at that time. Houston didn't have anywhere near about a half million at the most. That was it. Oh, okay. So everybody was crowded into seven schools. Oh, it made a big, big class. Well, in right, it made a very big. Yeah. Then uh, how did you select, uh, how did you come to Purdue? How did you select coming here? Well, that's the story. Would oh, you like good. to hear it? Okay. Um, my cousin, uh, Robert L. Merminton, a graduate of probably Purdue in 32, was an engineer who later went through aero engineering later. And, uh, Here at Purdue? No, because oh. aero wasn't really one of the designated. It was even mechanical, I think, originally. And uh, later was with Curtis Wright Corporation and later Curtis Electric Props propellers, competing with Hamilton Standard Props. Which, and uh, he was my hero, I mean, one of my heroes. And, uh, but he went to Purdue, which meant Purdue had to be good. and. Uh, I later went into the Army Air Corps and I flew and I was over in Burma flying uh, against the Japanese at that time. The war was coming to a close and I was anxious to get back into college. And, you hadn't uh, started college before you went into the service? I never admitted I did. I don't think I had a transcript. <laughs> Nevertheless, <clears throat> if you don't remember that, Joan, forget it. Okay. So anyhow, long story short, I wrote my father back and I said, I'm looking for a four-year degree in school that has air transportation or something related to aviation because that's what I intend to follow. Mm -hmm. And he, I told him Parks Air College, Spartan Aeronautics, and a whole bunch of others were commercial type schools that went for all the, the good education, but they didn't have a degree. And he came back with Purdue, surprisingly. And it was a beautiful pamphlet about Purdue's Air Transportation School, which had been developed at the end of 45. Right. And uh, it was exactly what I wanted. So I wrote in to see if I could get in. And I wrote to a guy named Frank M. Hockema, I believe, Dean Hockema at the time, Dean of Admissions, and said with a little bravado, I think I can bring a whole squadron to Purdue because we're all interested in air transportation and we're flying cargo aircraft. And uh, what are the chances? Nice letter back. Sounds fine, would love to have all of you, but everyone has to enter on his own merits, meaning we need to have a transcript from your high school and a few things like that. So I, I arranged all that in the transcript. Um, as you might admit, from the principal of my high school, who knew my family, wrote, 
that he hoped that I, in fact, he was sure that I had matured a great deal by being an officer in the Army Air Corps and flying in combat, and he would recommend me regardless of my grades in high school. Um, I got another letter from Dean Hockenbaum who said, uh, we have reviewed your transcript and so forth, and it is with pleasure. Uh, we are going to admit you, and we'd love to have you, and you can bring as many as you can. Well, I brought my crew at that time, a co-pilot, another pilot, and a radio operator. All coming to Purdue? They all came to Purdue. And uh, so we arrived at Purdue. And uh, Not, you'd never seen it before? No, I'd never been here. The nearest I had come to was make few thousand feet above flying over in, in activities. But long story, this is how I got to Purdue. I had no idea of Nancy being here, and I was happily surprised. And uh, more than that, I, I wasn't sure about Yankee country. <laughs> but anyhow, but uh, I that's how I got here. Right. Where'd you live when you were in Canada? Did, and were you in a fraternity when you were here? Or? Well, I used to call it uh, Gamma Epsilon whatever, a gosh dang independent, <laughs> whatever it was. Gamma Delta Iota. Gamma Delta Epsilon or something like that. Oh. But anyhow, no, I lived uh, initially in uh, your field house over here with 400 roommates. And what year did you enter Purdue? February 46. Okay, 46, okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were coming back had, like yourself, who'd been in the war. Yeah, oh yeah. So we the had, campus was <coughs> got really very full. did a leap. Uh, what you don't know is that uh, I was enrolled here and I had a dormitory assigned called Seneca II. Never heard of it, but it was, I arrived. A little post office at Terry Hall <coughs> complex, if you look on the east side of the building, right across from the field house, a little brick building. Walked in to get my, my keys to my new room and the guy died laughing almost. I said, what's funny? He said, there, there isn't any Seneca. I said, what do you mean? Well, it's not here yet. And I said, what do you mean it's not here yet? He said, well, there are buildings Purdue bought from the government war housing in Illinois, and they're shipping them down. And you've got a lot of roommates. I said, where? He said, right across the street. I said, what's over there? And he says, field house. There are double bunks all over the basketball floor, and there are a lot of other people over there. This is Lambert, Lambert Fieldhouse, right? Whatever, Ooh, that's it's right what across, right over here. There you go, okay. right, yeah. The old one. But it's still there. Oh, I know it's still. And so I uh, wandered across the tenor, 11 o'clock at night, walk in, darker than heck, a few little lights on, and he said, any bunk that's open, you got. I found one. I love that. <laughs> but it was welcome home to Purdue. <laughs> what am I doing here? But uh, well, didn't did your colleagues come with you at the same time? Pardon? Did your colleagues? Well, yeah, but they came from all, all different parts of the country. But they and, were and here. Different timing. Well, okay. I was first here, and uh, so they finally arrived. But uh, it was interesting because I woke up the next morning and I look across the bunks, and there's this. Uh, overnight bag, so to speak, with 8th Air Force marked all over with pilot wings written on it. And over here on this side is a guy, 5th Air Force Southwest Pacific. I was surrounded by other pilots from World War II, so I knew I had found a home. <laughs> That's how I got here. Okay. Where by the way, I later found out uh, Hakama was a World War I pilot. He also interacted with Amelia. Because yes, I know pictures. that. Yes, yes. Right, but because we have he, pictures. He saw somebody who wanted to fly, who wanted to go to college, and here we are. And Super. without he helped. Okay. Uh, where did then? Where'd you end up uh, living? Uh, well, later I uh, ended up uh, over in Seneca, which they finally built. Where was that? Would that been it located? Was, um, what's over there now? It, it, it here's the corner, southwest corner of Carey Hall Complex, the All block. Right. It's a street that goes along. It used to be a field out there, okay. and that's where they built them. Okay. And they okay. were temporaries, and uh, they were quite nice. They, they did a good job. And then later I found another guy I'd flown with in World War II lived here down on State Street, had a farmhouse down there. His mother did. And he said, well, come on down. So two or three of the guys that I had brought to Purdue and, and myself moved down there. So we spent the rest of our time uh, boarding or rooming with his family. Yeah, what'd you do about meals? Did you eat on campus? Well, 
Right. Initially, it was Seneca, yes. Oh. Down there, I think she did the cooking, yes. so it was kind of a room and board. Okay. Then later, we had a boarding house across from the street somewhere, down on Marstella Street, okay. whatever that is. Interesting, so, yeah. But I kept moving around. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about uh, some of your professors and the pro and a little bit about the program that you took. Well, where, right. and where were your classes held? Where were Aero? Well, air transportation had quite a bit at the airport. Grove Webster was involved quite a bit with it. Later, a guy named uh, Mark Fowler came in, Professor uh -huh. Fowler, and they were scattered throughout the buildings, econ, et cetera, and history. And so, so a lot of your, excuse me, a lot of your classes were held at the airport. Uh, quite a few. Okay. Not all, obviously not. But Some were on campus. Right. Yeah. And uh, so we scattered around, and I remember clearly Grove Webster very well because I flew for him. I was also an instructor pilot throughout college. Uh, in the program that you were taking, did it also include some flying? I mean, it, no. Oh. The GI Bill is what I took initially to get an instructor's certificate, okay. the CAA at that time. Mm -hmm. So that allowed me to then work my way through college flying as an instructor. So I had a staff sticker and all that good stuff, which was kind of nice. For part While of you were at Purdue, you were, yes. uh, were, were you were instructing what students in the A Tech department or? Yeah, well, department? actually, under Purdue Aeronautics Corporation. Uh, I see. They were under the GI Bill. They okay. were students at Purdue, but they flew there to get their license and other things. One of my students at one time was Jerry Goldman. Oh, well, well, tell, uh, for the researchers, clarify a little bit of Purdue Aeronautics. That you were, but they, but they were not. When they were not flying students, they had nothing to do with the A Tech department. Purdue Aeronautics really uh, oh. later became an adjunct of the AvTech department by being its flying role as far as professional flying. Okay. Uh, the other part of it was still Jim Maris, et cetera. They still produce the original pilots, but Purdue Aeronautics Corporation used them in the DC-3s and bigger airplanes. Okay. Did Purdue Aeronautics start here? Yes, it did. It did. 1942. That, I, that year I knew. Right. right. Grove Webster. Really started. He's the one who was involved. Absolutely. He has been the pioneer in civil aviation of what turned out to be civil aviation and really did a great job. And it was sponsored by President Elliott at the time. Okay. And okay. later President Huffley for sure. Okay. Any particular clubs that you joined when you belonged to when you were here? Not really, okay. except the Aero Club. Oh, the Aero Club. Nothing. What did that involve? Did you get some free flights? Nothing. Nothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I it was that. also who used Purdue Aeronautics Corporation airplanes. Okay. All we did was incorporate a little club so we could uh, have other pilots get to fly the airplanes. Sure. Okay. Then what came next? Tell us a little about what transpired after you graduated. We'll go back one point. Okay. Uh, we also had a Purdue uh, had an air freight research board, which has never been recorded to my knowledge, which were students uh, organized by an entrepreneur called Joe Minton. Because okay. I was the chairman, of course, <laughs> and had uh, a couple of professors at the time. I forgot Langley Longley was one, and uh, Ursulchuk was another one who was okay. in economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had people, because we had something at a university, we had people visit from American Airlines, United, TWA. We invited them out on the subject of air freight, what was developing. Kurtz Ray Corporation was involved, and you know, we all learned a lot. And that was the essence of it, whole thing. Uh, no money involved. I had to go out and get her airline money a few times, and I managed to get to get that. the people to come. Well, I needed their money too because sure. we had a little few expenses. Right. Okay. Uh, how about athletics? Did you go to any of the football football games? You well, I didn't have much time for that. Okay. okay. I had two majors in college: Nancy and aviation. Oh, okay. That's a pretty busy schedule then. Well, um, not only that, I'll add another one. I was flying for the Indiana National Guard too. So I was Governor Shirker's pilot for a while with the C-47s out of Stout Field, flying the Mustangs and other fighters. And So between flying there, flying for Purdue Aeronautics and dating Nancy, and occasionally attending class with a terrible record of attendance. When the classes were on campus, do you recall the building that may have been used was the what's known as Grissom Hall today, which may at one time been civil. I, Arrow I, used to be in there, and of course Arrow has now moved to the Armstrong, yes, as you probably know. I have no idea. There were buildings, you know, they were scattered all over the place. Right, and of course, what's really changed. Pardon? Now, I don't want to talk about that. 
<laughs> and Double Lee, they were here. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. No. Older brothers, they were there. My school. daughter is reminding me that I'm the guy who, as a senior, had to take freshman physics to finally get my degree. <laughs> uh, it was, and that woman, thank God for her, whew, she was so happy to see me leave. <laughs> She said, do I understand correctly, Mr. Antman, that uh, uh, you are a captain in the Air National Guard? And you, no, yes, ma'am. Uh, and you have been absent so many times, and you were flying President Hovde and Charter. And I said, yeah. She said, and you're married? Yes. And you have a brand new baby now? I said, yes, ma'am. <sighs> Get out of here. Well, then let's talk about your, your wife that you met her. Tell, tell us a little about that. How you happen to, to meet her here well, on campus? Uh, again, we uh, I uh, strolled over to the blanket with she and her friend, another Alpha Chi, and suggested we sit down and talk, which we did, and then it carried on from there. And she's the only one I dated in school. I think, so. What was her major? Would you Science. like? To? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. And good. so then she latched onto me, and I was her test case for now. Oh. <laughs> I was her lab. Then I gather you got married while you were here. Oh yeah. And, oh. Uh, we I married in '48, and I graduated in '49. She graduated in '48. Okay. So Whereabouts did you live? Did you live married suit and housing then when you got married? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, there wasn't any. Uh, first house we had was. Um, oh yeah. You know where the Monon tracks go through East Lafayette? Probably Fifth Street or whatever it is. I remember the trains, but they moved. They had railroad oh, yeah, they, they wrapped it up. Right. Yeah. We had uh, huh. a rooming boarding house that had partly been a house of ill repute, and they converted it to student housing because it was much more profitable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we lived there for about we could only stand it about three months. You had to go down the hall for bathroom. Uh, that was good. It's really shared a kitchen. Oh dear. So we moved to Lake Schaefer in the winter in a summer house. Oh. That was nice. <laughs> but so it was we, heated, right? Or no, it was <laughs> not. Oh. Well, somewhere. somewhere. I had to carry the, the oil up from the, the shore. <laughs> but anyway. So we lived there, and uh, then we finally moved into East Lafayette into a real home, a garage that had been converted. <laughs> It's still there. There was, no, there was no housing. No, no. Housing, I understand, yeah. was really, really mm -hmm. tight. And of so, course, there were well, some no. many dorms, and of course, mm -hmm. all the apartments, mm -hmm. and they didn't. Oh, yeah. So it was in, in individual houses where you'd get rooms and things of that sort. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's move on. Tell us what you did then after you graduated, and then we'll talk okay. about Purdue. Okay, well, well, it takes a while to get there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> uh, I left, um, went to back. You graduated in 49. In 49. I had already found out through my work with research board that I did not really want to go with the airlines. One, I didn't want to fly as a captain for the rest of my life because I'd had fun with management and people and doing things. And if I went with the airline in management, I would never get to fly. And then I looked at the Air Force. They had jets going. These guys were still in propellers. And it didn't, and I was already captain. And I succeeded there to a point. So I applied for regular Air Force, and I had to go back in, give up a rank, give up my flying until I made regular, very competitive. And uh, about that time, Korea broke wide open, and I still had to wait till I made regular. <laughs> so I, we stayed in the Air Force uh, through a period of, uh, I, got, I retired in 67 from the Air Force, and uh, flew transports, I was in staff, personnel, and uh, headquarters usually. Okay. And I asked for SAC B-47s, remember, got it out of Command and Staff College, and uh, flew the family. Uh, we were up in Plattsburgh, New York for five years, way up there by Canada. Wonderful. And then back to the Pentagon, I retired from the Pentagon, having been talked into something by Grove Webster, and a letter from Frederick L. Humpty about, uh, would you please join us at Purdue Aeronautics? So I retired early, and I came out to Purdue. Okay. So uh, with the family of six children and Nancy, and here we were. Okay. And when you lived on campus, uh, am I correct? It was the house in hort horticulture. Yeah. Park? It was called the Bees House. Professor okay. Bees was the head of the horticulture at one time, and it was his property that later I think had been deeded to the university, and his wife was allowed to live in that home 
It was about 18, an 18. It was he deceased by then? Yes. Oh, okay. But the home was built in 1890. It was a really beautiful home. And uh, so Mrs. B has reached a point where she couldn't really do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Took one look at us with a family of six and this whole big property. What? Bless you, my son. <laughs> she went under another home and uh, we took over the property. At Purdue, of course, rented it to us. And we couldn't buy it. We tried to buy it, couldn't do it. Right. So we lived there too close to the airport. Now, was the park, uh, was it only their property? wasn't a, a park at that it time? It was a park everywhere but the house. We had, in effect, you know, oh, okay. a, a piece of material, uh, you know, land that was deeded to the house. And did it have a, did Purdue you have a maintained everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Purdue maintained everything. Because of Purdue, she gave it to Purdue, and then you rented that's it from right. PRF that was that's involved right. in that. Yeah, okay. yeah, research on it. Right. Because they R. had old. RV Stir, I think. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have met him, you know, right, RV. He would like it. <laughs> then tell us about your duties and things, uh, Purdue Airlines. Okay. When I joined, it was Purdue Aeronautics Corporation. Okay. It had been sold before I got here, but I did not know that. Okay. I came out believing that Grove Webster, I really had stayed very Now, close. he started with Purdue Aeronautics. Was that the first corporation, and then it became Purdue Airlines? Yeah, or? it was okay. first Purdue oh, was Aeronautics Research Corporation. Of right. Okay. A leasing corporation, part of the university, but not. Okay. Because of liability, completely separate. Okay. Nonprofit, if it didn't make its own way, it couldn't exist. There was no funding from the university for it. It could rent from the airport and stay on the airport, but that was it's okay. on its own. So uh, we had, at that time, actually five DC-6s operating. Two for MPATI. Have you heard much about yes, MPATI? And I, yes, and that was an interesting program. Oh, boy. I knew about it before I came here, and I've interviewed like Dave Moses and some others to kind of fill in the right. gap, because it was a very unique program, and Purdue really was out in front oh, of yeah, doing absolutely. that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Well, Purdue's been out in front in aviation for as long oh, as Oh, yes, I can right, recall. but, that, but that, really, that doesn't exist anymore. And no, in thinking yeah. about what they were able to do in those days with oh, that yeah. equipment was just incredible. Well, and, of course, you talked to Jerry, who flew them. Right, exactly. And put the antenna down, 24-foot dragging antenna, stock, gyro right. stabilized. It was really quite good. Sure was. And he would push the DC-6s up to about 23,000 feet, which is not where they normally were supposed to be operating. And they would cruise for six hours or eight with that thing producing. Anyhow, those two airplanes were special. We had three that uh, Grove had managed to buy secondhand uh, from Western Airlines, actually. And These are DC-6s? Mm -hmm. Okay. And he, we still had the four DC-3s. And uh, you know how they got the, the DC-3s? No. <coughs> they built a couple of them. Purdue, Avtech, had the mechanic school and everything else, and they took a C-47, or two of them at least, and they literally re overhauled them completely and allowed it to be certificated for commercial use. And I think the Air Force sold it for 500 bucks or some terribly <laughs> low number. And then that, and they bought one from Eastern Airlines, a, a used DC-3. So that's the way it started. It was in, uh, it had freight and passenger capability, and it was good for the U.S. and Canada, and that was the certificate that they had. So it was a non-skid charter airline only, and that Purdue was hauling people around, and it literally had. What, what sort of charter service did you run? What, what was? Well, what was who the were our passengers? Yeah. Well, we had uh, Purdue, University of Arkansas, Ohio State. So it was I'm, all charter. Is that correct? All charter, okay. never a scheduled route at all, okay. precluded from it, and we had military charter too. So we really had passenger charter, quite a bit of it. Okay. I mean, it was making about a million, gross revenue about a million a year at the time. Did you fly uh, within the United States or out, as well as outside, or only? Only the U.S. and Canada. Oh, okay. And we only use Canada for hunting trips, the DC-3s, and fishing trips. Okay. So it was really a restricted area, very, very small. And then later, we, um, Grove had looked for, to try to find a buyer for it. It was becoming very difficult to keep going as a nonprofit, Mickey Mouse Airline, with all due respect, trying to compete with turboprop aircraft and later turbojet aircraft with no funding. And I think there were a lot of people who didn't care for a very small segment of Purdue having such liability, and it did in aviation. And being a part of Purdue graduating only relatively few people. So there was. 
There were many academically who said, well, why do we need that? Why run these risks? And I think the State House had something to do with that, yeah. too. What was, your liais what was the liaison, if any, with the Tech Department at that time for the Aurora Line? Did well, it was all part of an agreement between okay. the university and PAC okay. to provide this type of training for them, and it was funded by that. Okay. But so you did do some instruction for the oh, students? Oh, yeah, 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 we did. The students actually were actually into the right seat, co-pilot, first officer seat of the DC-3 is fully qualified as crew members and flew as crew members. They also flew as the DC-6 flight engineers, and they were trained and qualified in that. So they graduated being real airline pilots, okay. and they really had the flight engineer background too, as well as their quarter degree. Did That's you did you right. fly any the any of the administrators of the university, so the president at any time or not? No, Purdue maintained that for themselves. They Jim had Maris separate had planes. that. Yeah, okay. we did not. We we had you know for, we no we didn't because it was all big passenger stuff by that time. Okay, okay. Do you remember at the airport uh, when you were here they had a, a restaurant out there? Oh yeah. Yes, I yeah. really that was really nice. Pretty good. Bill Fleetermeyer was running yes, the airport. Yes, right. Then. Yeah, I used to see him out there, and it was it was fun. See people, a lot of people I talked to. A lot of people to. go out and watch airplanes. I know it was right. great. You know, it was just so, too bad that it went by the boards. It <laughs> did, but by the time um, I arrived, and I was the only vice president they ever had at PAC. Uh huh. So, uh, and Hubdi and I had reached agreements of what I was supposed to do over a period of time, and uh, after I got here, I found out I'd been sold. Oh, huh. interesting. And uh, it was going to be purchased by Stevens Incorporated down in Arkansas. That's the, the buyer. And it had to go to Civil Knox Board for approval. So we continued to operate as is until the approval came through. And with that, they'd ordered DC-9s already. And <laughs> they'd ordered the Playboy aircraft, or you know, he had sold that. So uh, it was kind of fun. Once you hit the ground running, there wasn't any stopping. <laughs> Oh, dear. So, but it really progressed well. It came very, uh, caveat for that. The Jim Maris, I think, was very disappointed that it had been sold because he and I both knew that as a profitable organization, there was only one objective, finally, to make a profit in order to keep going. Now, we, uh, they had agreed to leave it right here at Purdue continue to, quote, support Av. After it was sold by this person yeah, in Arkansas yeah, to yeah. the Arkansas. All, all, all was part of the agreement okay. when it was sold. As part of the sale agreement. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, but there wasn't really room for the same educational values because we wouldn't have the aircraft type that could be used. And there's a big difference of DC-9s and DC-6s. Yeah, imagine. So they, we did everything we could to, to accommodate. We even had jump seats for the students, but they couldn't log the time as pilots. They could log it as observers, but uh, okay. but they still graduated with a flight engineer um, certificate out of our 727, which we had for flight engineers, and then flying in the jump seat. Uh, they were really well qualified, right. to say the least. Were there uh, commercial airlines during that period as, at Purdue? While well, Lake here? Central. Lake Central. Was that one, probably one of the first ones, wasn't it? Well, that's probably the last one, too. Oh, well. They, sometimes they change names. Well, yeah. Well, there were a couple of <coughs> commuters out of Chicago area, and Lake Central, which had the route Lafayette, Chicago, and uh, Lake Central was the one that was primarily in and out of here. Uh, they were here for props. quite a long period of time. Yeah, they were. Probably yeah. mm. started off as Roscoe Turner Airlines. Um, it, what, and as I recall, and was this true that you went to Butler Aviation was not in the main Chicago airport? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, well, we had uh, for the commercial. I mean, for the commercial service that they had. I'm trying to think who we had contracted. We had a contract operator uh -huh. at O'Hare for okay. us to be gated and serviced, and that we maintained them here. So, but we used those gates. And sure. I don't think it was Butler. I think it was one of oh, the airlines. Okay, okay, alrighty. What's I, uh, what about staffing? Or how much uh, would you have for staffing? We had about 100 to 125. Smallest airline in the U.S. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> As a matter of curiosity, uh, the paper we presented to Elizabeth and David 
uh, is a real rundown of PAC, non-personalized. It's purely what happened okay. to PAC and for the airlines. So it's, it would serve you well, I think, to scan that because almost everything I'm saying here has been is written. That's out. very good. We right. appreciate that. Well, That's really there good. hasn't been anything like that right now. The nearest is John Norberg's book, who talks a little bit about this and the other. And Emilio Salazar, you have some papers of. You had some oral history. I, mean, I um, right. remember Jerry talking about him, as I recall. He had something he had written on personal, and right. Jerry has been interviewed, but it's never been written. Yeah. And it's nice that that special award that the airport got a couple of years ago from the, uh, you know, it's a unique, they have that plaque out there. I haven't uh, seen down. it. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about, a little about that. When, then, uh, when did you leave Purdue then? When, the air when we finally were told by Stevens that uh, he was going to close it down. It was not as profitable as early as he wanted. And with, uh, remember what the Dow Jones was in, in 19, you don't either. It went to 600. Oh. And Stevens Inc., went, it was a pretty big hit organization. It had many holdings and they were really concerned about where is it going to go from here. They only had one airline holding. And that what was year would this be, 71 you're talking about? Early 71. Okay. So <laughs> he had me come down. We talked it over. He said, I'm really not going to go through 71. Even though you might reach profitability at the end of the year, uh, I'm not going to live through that year. All airlines were really down to the dumps. And uh, we, were, we were the only one making progress. We doubled our revenue in one year. And, half again the next, and we expanded our commercial part by at least 100%. Hmm. So it was making good, but it wasn't getting there as fast as he would like. Okay. And so he did get out of the airline business. So they closed it in April of 71. Okay. What did they do with a lot of the equipment? Well, thankfully, the DC-9s had gained in value, and so they were sold, right. did very well. And they sold the engines, which did well. And he did a very fair job of everything. He made all the debts complete, bought everything out, and closed it. Okay. And then what, what, what uh, was your next move? What, hmm. what, you had to give up that, <laughs> up that, up that house. Yeah. Well, we, I was offered by one of my competitors uh, an opportunity to go to Singapore, Republic of Singapore, and uh, start a small airline out there <laughs> in competition with their state airline, which had just separated from Malaysia, Malaysia Systems Air, whatever it was. So they had Singapore Airlines, which later has become the best airline almost in the world at this point in time. But they were gonna run it themselves in Singapore, whereas the Malaysians had uh, seconded everything to the Australian Qantas. And so Lee Kuan Yew said, I'm not sure if this is gonna work. Why don't we get somebody that has experience running airlines to run a small one, competing with it, so to speak, not competing with there. And in case things go wrong, we can scarf it up and go from there. And that sounded like a pretty good prospect. So I ran an airline from scratch from Singapore to London. <laughs> Did you move to relocate to Singapore? Oh, no, we didn't. Okay. First, Nancy moved with family to uh, Hawaii. Yeah, Hawaii. We had only three of the six children still at home at that time. Joan had married, and Mike was graduating, and, and uh, they were all doing fine. Okay. So there we were in Singapore, and we stayed for about uh, a total of two years in that. And uh, Singapore Airlines didn't really like this possible competitor in their midst. And so British Airways and Qantas and, and all the other major carriers pretty well clamped us down. So I moved back to the U.S. Oh, okay. <laughs> all righty. Okay. Um, then did you, what, what came next? <laughs> British Caledonian Airways, which is a, a British carrier right. operating the Atlantic. And uh, I was their senior VP U.S. And uh, the government changed and they, <laughs> they were, took over and said, we, we don't need another airline competing with British Airways. We'll close them down. <laughs> that was that was when I decided I had enough to see I, was, <laughs> I don't want to be anybody's president anymore, and uh, I was very happy to do some other things. So sure. Okay. I was with the National Transportation Safety Board as their managing director for a couple of years, and then later went with the National Safety Council, Green Cross for Safety out of Chicago. Family stayed here. I rotated. Yeah. 
Let's talk about the family, about the children. Any of them come to Purdue? Any? Yeah, all of them. Okay. Almost. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. three of the six okay. graduated from Purdue. Two of the three married at Purdue. And uh, the other three. Grandchildren. Well, you have grandchildren, yeah. Joan has two children that graduated from Purdue. Okay. And, uh, but that, that's about where the, the clan is at the moment. So the rest went to different schools, and all graduated, and all did this and the other. But uh, that sounds that's all right. That sounds we have good. ten grandchildren and six kids. <laughs> do you are you um, do you participate in the in the alumni chapter in your locally at any no. time? Oh, okay. I never have really. Okay. Okay. Do you come back to Purdue uh, for any games or weekends or things? No. For your, I came back with the grandkids. Yeah. Do they still have some uh, children here now? No. Grandchildren, no. but they did. Okay. Oh yeah, well, okay. for that purpose, and uh, yeah. but really, life kept going rap rapidly. Sure. We just right. didn't get involved in the alumni thing. I'm sorry. Well, now with the uh, <coughs> with the Big Ten, you if you you can follow. Oh yeah, it's all over. Football, and I talked to some, I just recently interviewed somebody who, <coughs> who likes to try to get here but can't always, and the Big Ten has been really a, a big savior. For oh yeah, them, you know, which is really kind of mm. nice because even the regional things don't often pick up. Uh -uh. Purdue. Um, how about a Purdue tradition? Do you have any tradition that comes to mind that you'd like to share with us? Not really. Not really. How about an outstanding event? Purdue Airlines. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And um, tell us a little about retirement activities, what you've been involved in. I understand you worked on a publication or? Well, basically, I retired, retired. Okay. Uh, much the surprise of everybody. <clears throat> And I was not too interested in working anymore and consulting okay. and all that. We just didn't. We really volunteer didn't. work. We did a lot of volunteer work. But, uh, That's nice. Yeah. We never. Man I always managed to avoid being on a board of directors of, of a condo, and we've lived in a couple of condos. And we always had committees that we did things with. And Nancy and I worked together a lot of stuff. But generally, traveling, doing things we wanted to do, I okay. continued to fly pretty actively until about mm, five years ago, and I fly occasionally. Any particular spot that you uh, that you travel to that you've not been to before? No, not really, huh? Um, Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii. Well, okay. but yeah. we lived in Hawaii two or three yeah, times. Right. So yeah, right. Yeah. We it changed? know Hawaii well. Had it changed? Oh, my, yes. Oahu is our favorite island there, <clears throat> and uh, it's just awful much, but it's a lot of fun. We, we know where to go and what to sure, do. Sure, sure. Right. So, and we like Florida, and we found Puerto Rico a lot of fun too. And, <clears throat> quicker to get to from the East Coast than Hawaii. That's true. That's very true. much. Yeah, that's and right. Very yeah. similar. Yeah. But no, we find it's been an excellent life. Could ask for no more. How did you happen to decide to re to settle in, in Virginia? Was that your retirement spot? or had you Well, we've been, a, oh. go ahead, Nancy, oh, you're as good. We've been in and out of Virginia a lot. Oh, I see. Know. Yeah, we started out uh, in that area because he was at Andrews Air Force Base. We lived in Maryland then, right. but then later we lived in Springfield because he was at the Pentagon, and then later we came back with all these different uh, organizations he'd been with, and we were living in Virginia, basically. So uh, we settled in Reston in the early 70s when uh, that was a new town center type of thing, and uh, loved it, and we've been in and out of Reston for about 30 years. Yeah. So, um, and we live very close to Reston right now. Yeah, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of family and relatives, well, colleagues like and things. That, that's, that's basically well, home. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really a center because the truth is, you got mountains, you got the seashore. I mean, everything mm -hmm. is really pretty. Virginia's mm -hmm. a pretty good state. Yeah. So we've enjoyed. It. Yeah. Uh, in closing or in summary, anything that I forgot to ask or that you'd like to share with us, or something that uh, I missed. I don't, I, we pretty well covered it, but in summation, I, I've, I've been lucky in life. I've done everything I set out to do. Some good, some bad, some not as good as others, but I could never look back uh, with anger at anything. I, I could have stayed with the Air Force and moved on, and I would have done okay. You know, I, I had no idea when I left the Air Force I was coming to the airline like we did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're there, you've cut the bridges behind you, and there you are. And I have to say, the good Lord has been good. Right. Let me ask you this. How, when you come back to Purdue, how has the cha uh, campus changed a lot? Has it grown, do you think? Um, take a look at uh, 
the picture that we gave Elizabeth yesterday, okay. which was the Purdue DC-9 over the campus. My young son, one of my young sons, and I were out in a Cherokee airplane, a little fort place, taking pictures to give to Douglas Aircraft so that when they painted the picture of the new DC-9 of Purdue, it would be over the campus. And that'll give you an idea of how much okay. it's grown since 1970, right. or yes. 67. Right, yeah. And for the researchers, I want to thank you. You've given some papers and things to the Virginia Kelly Current Archives and Special Collections. We appreciate that. It's very nice. Happy to do it. And um, glad to well, I'm preserve just, what has been. Really, I really have said, they're, they're, I'm just finding, every time you look, you find a little bit more. Right. But it isn't centralized. The Archives didn't have it as such, like PAC and Purdue Airlines. Sure, right. And I've contained the fact that Amelia came along and all the good things, and Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong came along. What was in between? And I've called it the missing chapter of civil aviation. <coughs> At campus. And mm -hmm. pretty well is true. Yeah. Uh, there has not been one place you could look. That's right. Uh, and talking with Tom Carney over that, he, I originally started with him. I was going to give everything to, to Tom. And uh -huh. The more Joan got involved, the more we found <laughs> this research area, I mean, all of the archives is right. where this should be because Tom can always get it for what he wants. And it is, it is the university. Uh, it has been authorized to be president. Of, it's a university archivist he right. authorized, so it's really, it's I really think nice. Yeah. We found the home for it. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Well, and we found yesterday talking to Tom um, that there are a lot of little pieces that are here, there. Uh, I think his wife has a uniform. Well, I'm not sure you should say that. I don't, oh. I don't know. But there are things that, because, yeah. um, that, that are, are still scattered a yeah, lot around but, campus you know, that pe people don't even actually are aware of no, that we know. No, they've got so. them. Yeah. Jerry gave a lot of stuff to uh, both Tom and Karen, helping move yeah. him out right. until he died. And they've, you know, they've moved that stuff forward. But sure. there's more. Every individual has something. That's right. Whole thing. I think it's the pilots also, Salazar, and uh, some of them have given some information. Yeah, right. yeah. whatever. And Cabeza um, did too, I right. think, and, yeah. and others. So I think all these little things being brought together is right. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. Thank you very much too. Okay.